and we move on to the final talk of the morning session. Petr Krivitsky will talk about linear fragments of geometry. Thank you. So, I realized it was almost a matter of good manners that uh, every speaker at the beginning of the talk states clearly whether the talk will be about weak arithmetics or not. So, I will keep the tradition. Uh, but it's really hard to tell for me because the arithmetics I will be talking about are on a different hierarchy than the usual hierarchy of induction on the amount of induction. Which, which can be stratified to the weak and strong arithmetics. So, I move on to defining what the hierarchy of so called linear arithmetics, which I will be, I will be talking about, is. So everybody knows Presburg arithmetic, which is the full induction arithmetic for the language with addition. The other arithmetic is, again, full induction arithmetic for the language with addition multiplication. And in the same manner, I define here the linear arithmetic, which is again arithmetic with a full induction, so not weak in the sense of induction, but for the language which is somewhere in between these two. So it's, it contains addition and then multiplication by one new unary or one new unary function of multiplication by one, one element, which is for non-triviality required to be non-standard. So one new non-standard element which we can multiply this. Okay, so similarly we can define other linear arithmetic, so kappa linear arithmetic for any cardinal kappa is an arithmetic with full induction for the language which contains kappa is, is different multiplication by kappa, kappa different elements all of them are standard. So then we get this kind of hierarchy. When we have kappa equal to zero, it means no scholars, no, no, no these multiplicative elements, then we get Pressburg arithmetic, LA1 is just what I on the previous slide called LA, and then we get the others, LA2, LA3, and so on. So this is the hierarchy I will be talking about. Okay, so Let's, let's get to how models of these arithmetics look like. And it's not, not hard to see that the models of such arithmetics are basically ordered modules. Some special ordered modules with other properties, not generic ordered modules, but, but ordered modules nonetheless. So every model of the linear arithmetic with just one scholar can be, in a canonical way, extended to a discreetly ordered module, so to a structure of this kind, over some ring. So uh, what, what one has to do is to extend the universe to include all the negative elements, and then to define multiplication by all the elements from the ring. And the ring will be exactly all the rational polynomials in this one A, this element, which are integers in the sense of the model. So, for example, elements like 2a will be in the ring. And multiplication by 2a can be defined as a times x plus a times x in the sense of the original language. a squared will be also in, in the uh, ring. And the multiplication is, again, easily definable. And also the fractions, because we have rational coefficients, so for example, a half can be, again, very easily defined uh, from, the, from the original structure. So from, from these examples, you can, you can clearly see that it really is very easy to define multiplication by all the elements from QA, which are integers in that. All right. So, Again, this, this all can be done in the completely same way for the higher order linear arithmetics. Only the ring will be different. It will be the rational polynomials in kappa many variables. So, alpha, A alpha for alpha and kappa. Uh, okay, and I will very often identify the model of the linear arithmetic 
with the ordered module because they are basically the same type of structure. All right, so now, now something about the context. I will be speaking about definability properties in the models of these linear arithmetics. There are two very closely related, simpler situations. So first of all is when we, from the ordered modules, forget the ordering and we consider all the usual unordered modules. And the other one is when we keep the order, but we forget the scars from the ring. And we just take a billion group, basically. Then our Resberger arithmetic in our case, that's the same thing. So discreetly ordered inductive Z modules. Okay, so these are the two simpler situations, and in each of them there is some quantified elimination theorem which is well known. For the case of unordered modules, it's bauer monk theorem which says that any such module over associative ring with unity uh, has quantified elimination up to positive primitive formulas. A positive primitive formula in general, is to recall, is a formula which is existentially quantified conjunction of atomic formulas. That's positive primitive formula. And every formula in, in a module is always equivalent to a Boolean combination of primitive positive formulas, which means in this special case it's a Boolean combination of existentially quantified systems of linear equations. So that's our among theorem. Very similar quantified elimination theorem, which is known to everybody here, I suppose, is a Pressburger elimination theorem, which says that Pressburger arithmetic again has the same kind of quantified elimination to primitive positive formulas, which in this case are, uh, are formulas of the form just this junction, we, because we are ordering, we can get rid of the negation. And, and everything else in the Boolean combination, and we have these junctions of existentially quantified systems of linear inequalities here, because we have the inequality in the, in the language. All right, so the natural question is whether this PP, uh, primitive positive elimination, generalizes well to the case of linear arithmetics. And I will try to show, in parentheses, because I will not really show that, but to state that, that the answer is yes, only for one scalar. If we, we have one scalar, one, uh, one element which we can multiply with, then, then yes, there is again the same EP elimination. And for two and more scalars, there is not. All right. And in the process, uh, I will also characterize completely all the definable sets in the models of LA1 and tell something about how the definable sets look like in other higher order linear arithmetics. Okay, so definable sets in the models of LA1. So now for a while I will be speaking only about the case where I have just one scalar. And not on the not about the higher order arithmetics. Okay, so uh, I will speak about discretely ordered modules, which is a little bit more general context than this, but we know it's basically the same thing. Uh, because every model of LA can be understood as certain discretely ordered module over this ring. And for the ring, of course, everybody sees that it contains all the polynomials in A with integer coefficients, and it's included in the, in the rational polynomials. So it's somewhere in between these two. And uh, it is uniquely determined by the class of all remainders of the element A modulo standard numbers. It, it uniquely determines the isomorphism type of this, of this, mod, of this ring. It's, it's easy to see. It really doesn't depend on anything else than, than, the, than the remainders modulo standard numbers. Okay, so, so therefore I will often write just R tau instead of Ra because I can pick any of the isomorphic copies for different A's which have the same remainder class tau. 
Okay, and another property which is which is important, any model of linear arithmetic is so-called integrally divisible module over its ring. And integrally divisible means just that the division with remainder is possible in, in the module. It follows from the induction, so we have it there. Okay. So now I will fix some ring, R now, and fix some module over it, which is discretely ordered, has in the signature element one, which is the least positive element, and it's integrally divisible over the ring. So it, this M doesn't have to be necessarily a model of linear arithmetic, but every model of linear arithmetic has these properties. So that's a little bit more general. Okay, and uh, yes, that's what I said. Any, any model satisfies these assumptions. And we will show or state that to quantify elimination for such a module happens in the language which is extended by the functions that provide the integral division, the division with the remainder, uh, by all scalars from the ring. So I will denote n prime the expansion of them to this new language. It's definable by a very easy formula. And this is the, basically the main theorem, which says that for any formula phi of this expanded language, there are finitely many terms of this expanded language, such that whenever the formula has a solution in N, then one of the terms provides the solution. So this is, again, even stronger than quantified elimination. It's uh, quantified elimination by finitely many terms. So, but, but you can see that from this, the quantified elimination solves, because we can eliminate this quantifier by replacing it with, with the disjunction and the terms. So, that's the corollary, this structure and prime in the extended language has quantified elimination, and so in the original language, the module L has the quantified elimination where you just need to replace the new defined terms by the definitions, and it's easily seen that this is a positive primitive formula, so it's really very easy to see that the quantified elimination is up to these junctions of primitive positive formulas in the completely same way as it was for the power long and for Pressburger. All right. Another thing, the usual formulation of the quantified elimination language for Pressburger arithmetic doesn't have the integer division there, but the congruence is modulo standard numbers. So I will only remark on that. The congruence is module standard numbers, which are in the QE language of Pressburg arithmetic, are really quantifier free definable from these functions r to the minus 1 by, by this simple thing. I just divide the x minus y and then multiply again and see if it's the same, then it's, then it's congruent. So uh, from this, the quantifier, the usual way how to say the quantified elimination from Pressburger follows. But it's not the other way around. We are not able to define the integral division in a quantifier-free way from the congruences. So that's, that's the reason why I need to uh, have congruences when I am having non-standard scalars. Non-standard scalars. For the standard scalars, it's the same. But for the non-standard, I, I need this instead of the congruences. OK. And the proof of this is quite long, technical. I will not do it here. I only say some notes on the proof. So the proof consists of basically developing the calculus of these kind of functions, so-called bracket functions, which is function uh, Q over R on X, which first X is multiplied by Q and then integrally divided by R. And these functions 
have very interesting, not completely regular, but not completely irregular graphs, and, and uh, it, the calculus for them basically extend the calculus of continued fractions. So continued fraction corresponds to, to this simple bracket, and when we compose more brackets together, which we need to do, then we get something which is more general and complex than continuous fractions, and, and that's the calculus about. Okay, and another note is that this problem of the elimination for, for linear arithmetic is much harder than the both of the simpler situations, the uh, unordered modules and the Pressburger arithmetic. And a simple illustrative reason for that is just the, one of the simplest case, if we, if we wanted to try to eliminate the quantifier in this formula. Well, there is x and y larger than zero, such as z equals qx plus ry, where q and r are some fixed colors from the ring. Then, it is we need to consider the set generated by q and r in the positive part of, of x. That's what we need to really consider and see how this set looks like when we want to eliminate this quantifier. And how, how this set looks like? It's quite easy to draw. So we start from zero, and we have somewhere the least common multiple L, L, L of the two scalars involved. And about this, so from here on, the set is very simple because above the least common multiple, the set is just all the multiples of the greatest common divisor. That's, that's easy arithmetic, elementary arithmetic, which says that, maybe even weak arithmetic, which says that this is the, the case. So here is just Px, where P is the greatest common divisor of, of the two scalars. But here, in this interval from 0 to L, to so below L, it's actually quite messy. Because <laughs> here, it, you, uh, when we have the restriction here uh, on the coefficients S and Y, that they are both non-negative, then not every multiple of the GCD is expressible in this way. From the Bezos theorem, we can express every multiple of GCD in this way, but, but with possibly negative one of them, one of the uh, coefficients x and y negative. So, so here it's quite messy, hard to say what, how it looks like exactly. And so this is the restatement of, of what I said just now. And now for Pressburger arithmetic, the least common multiple of the two scalars is standard number, of course, because the scalars are standard. So the messy part is finite, and we can get rid of it easily in the elimination because it's finite. We just can put the disjunction of everything. So it's eliminable here. For the case of unordered modules, we have no inequalities actually. So the situation looks like different. There is no x and y, no, no restriction on non-negative non elements because we cannot express this in the language. So the set S looks like the multiples of the GCD everywhere. There is no messy part at all. So it's again easy, easily eliminable. We can express this by a congruence. But for real linear arithmetic, the number L can be non-standard. So the messy part is infinite, and that's, that's the problem. We, we cannot get rid of the messy part here. This is just the simplest case when the problems start. And the general problem is that we have the messy part, not just one-dimensional, but multi-dimensional, and, and we need to, of course, also speak about uh, sets which are not just qx plus ry, but but uh, general terms in the extended language, so we use also the division there, and it's, it's really quite messy, technical, and not easy. All right, so that's, that's for the proof. 
And now I will classify all the definable sets or state how the definable sets in such models look like. So yeah, first when I will be talking about terms and formulas, I will always mean in the extended language. And I will denote by C the set of all constant terms in, in that language. Okay, so how does first the definable functions look like? So by the quantified elimination theorem, which was there before, we know that every definable function is in fact piecewise a term. It's finite because we have for any formula which has a, has a solution, we have finitely many terms which provide a solution. So when we have a formula which defines a function, then the function is piecewise, finite, finitely many pieces, and on each of it is a term of the language. So it's a piecewise term. Which means exactly this expression, some tau x where it is t i x on the set definable by, by some formula of psi i x. Okay. So that's that's the first approximation. And now it's enough to characterize all the terms and we will have the characterization of all the definable functions. So how do terms look like? Well, again, on the first side quite complex because the functions of integer division are not distributive with respect to addition and they do not commune with the multiplication. They, we cannot easily simplify, for example, this expression by, by taking the r to the minus 1 inside of the brackets and inside of the multiplication. But also it cannot be done easily, it can be done. So when we take the simplest possible terms, imaginable, which are the harmonic terms, so just, just r minus 1 to some variable, and we take all the linear combinations of these, plus maybe some constant. So this is it. We call such terms harmonic terms. It's, it's an analogy to Fourier analysis, basically, where you have some basic harmonic elements and linear combinations of them. So this, these are harmonic terms. Very, very easy to draw a graph of such thing. So very, very easy behavior. And uh, I, will, I will actually show that every term is this, with some limitation, which I will make precise later, <coughs> and a well, harmonic term. So, before, before I get to this, I need to say that the formula or some piecewise term are called harmonic if all the subterms of it are harmonic, and they are called quantifier free if all subformula, subformulas are quantifier free. So, in this terminology, I just need to one more concept. What an almost term is? Almost term is a piecewise term which has the same core. It's basically it's almost the same term as everywhere, only differs by some constant noise. So it's uh, it looks like this. The graph of this would look like this. I will have some finitely many pieces and it will be the same term, something like this, but on each piece it will be moved to another level only. So that's how all those terms look like. And the harmonic form theorem says that every term, in fact, is equal in the model to a quantifier free harmonic almost term. So every term can be equivalently written as some harmonic term which with some finite noise, finite constant noise. Okay, and for, for the quantifier free, I mean that these formulas are quantifier free. And since similarly for every formula, there is quantifier free formula which is harmonic. That means all terms inside are harmonic. Okay, and now for the representation of the definable sets. <coughs> if a formula is harmonic, uh, is it required that the pieces are also defined by harmonic formulas? Uh, or is it not? 
For for the, for the almost term, you mean, or for what? Yes, yeah, suppose we go uh, number it, two. Yes. Harmonic formula. All terms oh, in there are, there are no pieces. It's just a formula. <laughs> <laughs> formula okay. has no pieces. Formula may contain some terms. Yeah, yeah. And all the, the terms, terms are, are, harmonic. are harmonic terms. Harmonic terms. So not so not harmonic almost terms. Okay. Harmonic almost terms. terms. Harmonic yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There are no pieces in all. Okay, and for the representation of the definable sets, it can be said very, very easily. Every definable set is just a finite union of linear images of some polyhedra. So the picture would be like this. So when I have the model here, 0, m, then every definable set can be a linear image. I will have some rectangle or, or multidimensional box here and some polyhedra inside it. Finitely many, not convex polyhedra. Finitely many of them. And some linear mapping from here to the model such that the definable set here will be exactly the image of these finite many polyhedra. That's how all the definable sets look like. And it can be set in a more precise way. So I have some this box, Ka, multidimensional box in M. Polyhedron, of course, means a set which is definable by the system of linear inequalities. And yeah, this is the precise statement of, of the, what I said. Every x definable set from some parameters x can be written as a union of linear images of polyhedra uh, in, in this some box times m, because the box itself is bounded and it has to be unbounded. So, for example, just to draw, draw an example of how some definable sets is represented in this way. So, for example, a set of all even numbers is of course definable. So, A is even numbers. So, every second here inside the set and everything is not. And this is represented by a box which just has one side of length 2 and the other side is the whole M. So it's the box 2 times M. And the polyhedron, the only polyhedron will be the second vertical line here. And when I have the linear mapping of this, which goes horizontally first, so lexicographic mapping from, from the box here, so this is first element, which is mapped to zero, this is the second map to one, so sorry, it's, it will be a definition of odd numbers well, in the way I, I draw it. Okay. So the first is defined uh, max to zero, the second in the first line is defined to one, and then I go to the next line, three, four, five, six, and so on. Then in this way, this polyhedron, this polyhedron exactly corresponds in this mapping to odd numbers, for example. Okay, so that's, that's the representation. And now, you can state some model theoretic properties of, of the linear arithmetic itself. So from the, it, it all follows from the quantified animation very easily. So for example, the linear arithmetic is model complete. Uh, has the quantified animation up to primitive positive formulas. Another, another thing which is easily seen is uh, that two models of linear arithmetic are elementarily equivalent if and only if their scalars are congruent modulo all standard numbers. So something you would guess probably that it's the case. And from this we have, or the, another equivalent statement of this is the description of all simple complete extensions of the linear arithmetic. It's not complete theory, but all the complete extensions are of the form LA tau 
where tau is just the uh, class of remainders of, of the scalar A. So it's, it's written here in a complicated way, but it just says that A has the remainders given by tau. And uh, for all consistent classes of remainders for your whole standard numbers, these exactly are all the simple complete extensions of the linear arithmetic. Every such complete extension has a prime model. The prime model is exactly the ring R tau, which can be expressed algebraically from tau, but it's, it's too complicated to, to, to read it here. So this is just the ring of the module, and that's the prime model of, considered as a module over itself, it's a prime model of, of this complete extension. The linear arithmetic is decidable theory, again, follows from the quantified variation, and from the complete extensions, the decidable ones are exactly those which have the recursive class of remainder style. And the last thing, from again the quantified elimination, it can be easily seen that the induction scheme in, in linear arithmetic can be replaced by the scheme of integral divisibility by all positive scalars. <coughs> uh, not, not even the rational ones, it's enough to take the integer polynomials. But it's, it's the equivalent if I would write Q here, it's the same thing as well. So it's the same as for the Pressburger arithmetic. There also induction can be replaced by the integral divisibility, the same for the arithmetic. Okay, so these properties are all basically the same as for Pressburger arithmetic. I will skip this corollary, which just characterizes the, the models of LA as ultra products of some some finite structures, uh, and I will maybe only mention what are the differences in model theoretic perspective between Pressburger and linear arithmetic. So it uh, concerns the properties which are known to every model theorist, NIP and DP minimality, but I will remind them here very briefly. Uh, a theory is called NIP, meaning not independence property, if the following pattern is forbidden in any model of, of the theory. It's forbidden, forbidden that there is some formula, phi, and two sequences. One is indexed by natural numbers, the other is indexed by subsets of natural numbers, and they correspond in such a way that Phi holds about some a i and b j exactly if i is element of j, if the number is in the subset. So basically, it can be said that theory is an IP if no model of the encodes the power set of n. That's that's the easy way how to say. It. And in the same way, theory is DP minimal if another kind of pattern doesn't exist, and it's pattern which has two formulas and two sequences of indexed by natural numbers only, such that the following infinite formula has a solution in M for any ij in M. And it says just that the first formula is true only for ai and not for any other a case. And the second one is true for bj and not for any other, and the aj can be arbitrary. Basically, if I, would, uh, if I wanted to state it in this way, it's very roughly and vaguely stating that there, there is no encoding of a bijection between uh, m squared and n. So, no encoding in any model of bijection between m squared and n, that's the minimality. Okay, and uh, from DP minimality, the NIP property follows. That's a that, uh, known fact. And we know that Pressburg arithmetic is DP minimal and does also NIP. That's, that's also very, very well known. But for linear arithmetic, this is different. It is still NIP, but not DP minimal anymore. So the, the DP minimality disappears when we add the non standard color for multiplication. So I will skip the proof. It's, 
it's not important. And I will say some application for the structure of models of Ayano arithmetic. So from, from these observations about the quantified alienation in LA, we can prove actually a very interesting thing about how the values of the multiplication in model of Perron arithmetic are determined by other values. So we will, we have a, when we have a fixed, saturated, from, from technical reasons, a saturated model of Kressberger arithmetic, and we have some Peano multiplication on this additive model of Kressberger arithmetic, then its value in some point CD, it's the value C times D, is uniquely determined by the values on the line I will draw the picture maybe. So I have somewhere here the point C D and I have some A here and this line A times X for N X or A X for N X and the value of a multiplication in this point is uniquely determined by the values on this line if and only if either C or D are polynomials in A with rational dimensions. That's, that's what, what is easy corollary. You can guess that, if not see that, because this A is exactly the scalar that the, the values of of the multiplication on this line are exactly the values of the scalar multiplication, multiplication and, and then it's only easy step to, to see that really it is determined only if you get at least one of these other scalar which is definable from this, that means an element of which is polynomial over Q in A. So that's, that's this, this is the precise statement of the same thing, and I will just end with, with stating how it looks like for the higher order, where again a lot can be said, but I will state only the basic thing. The quantified elimination is not true anymore, and uh, even, even uh, the model that exists, the very wild models of the LA2 arithmetic, so wild that they're uh, that uh, a non-standard initial segment of some Peano multiplication is defined only there. So this is the result is good luck, and I will end it here. Thank you. Do you have any clue on the complexity of the elimination? So we from friend from no. traditional we know that this one is. Yeah, I, I have I have no idea. <laughs> It, it is basically an algorithm, but I never never tried to estimate the complexity of the algorithm. So, so do you think it's much higher than the... Sorry? Do you think it's much higher than the traditional... Uh, I, I, I would guess it's... As the proof is much more complicated than the proof for Resburger, I would say it's even the complexity of the, of the algorithm will be higher, but I'm not sure about that. Probably a silly question has nothing to do with what you are doing, but when you define your x uh, definable sets, I was wondering because it seems to me if we do does it have to do anything to do with uh, recognizable sets for some x's? Oh, I don't know what recognizable sets are. So, okay. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe later. So in these higher order arithmetics, uh -huh. is it? I do see in this. Um, bottom part of the slide that you don't have elimination to existential formulas. Yeah. Do you know whether you have a veritable quantifier hierarchy or is it known that it collapses down to a uh, yeah. it, it doesn't collapse and <laughs> that's what I wanted to say later where it is. It has bounded quantified elimination. All of the arithmetics LA Papa have bounded quantified elimination. Not to existential formulas. Okay, so it's bounded too bounded. So, so, yeah. so it's delta zero, but you cannot get rid of the complexity of bound quantifiers. Yes, yes. Okay. That's, that's cool. If there are no further questions, let us um, end this talk and the morning session and thank Patrick and all our speakers once again.